Hello, welcome back to Through the Trap Door. I'm Emily. And I'm Katie. And this is our podcast where we read you Harry Potter fan fiction. Do you have any fun announcements this week? Uh, I feel I, like I ask you every week and we never have any new or fun announcements. I mean, our I think our most exciting and like announcement niest thing is we have officially officially decided we've talked about it for months that we will be going to LeakyCon in boston yes just neither of us can afford tickets right now but they're all still available yes. so we're gonna so still it's, buy it's the fine. three-day yes. ticket eventually soon and then we'll have a little girls weekend stay in the city for three days yes. leave the boys at home then they'll come see us one of the days yeah it'll be a great time yeah I'm excited. There's so many people, too, from this Wizarding World Collective. I know. I'm so excited supposed- to meet everyone. I know. I can't wait to meet everybody in person and not and not just be, like, Facebook friends with everyone. Yes. In other exciting news, shortly, I say shortly, but it's, like, another month and a half, we'll be getting an official podcast room and not just, like, the weird echoey location of my living room. Right, because we'll have our own little room in your new house. So excited. Finally getting a new house. Yeah, I pro- we probably won't end up recording in there until late May. So this week, we are drinking wine that I provided. Yes. From Neshoba Winery, which is from Neshoba Valley here in Massachusetts. It is called Maiden's Blush. It's delicious. It's a nice little light kind of fruity spring wine. Yes. It's winier than we normally drink, but mm-hmm. in a good way. So last week, uh, Harry was attempting to be taught wandless magic by Snape and Dumbledore. Dumbledore was being his usual mysterious sassy self. Right. Super just like... Snape was being condescending. Normal. Her normal. Harry, as always, was being a brick wall. Not realizing what they were saying to him. Yep. Uh, And then Malfoy challenged Harry to a duel, one-on-one, no seconds. Uh, Like a real duel this time, not like first year where he was a bitch ass and sent Filch to the trophy room. Checking out. And they agreed that it had to be before curfew. curfew. (laughs) Okay, so this week, chapter 17, The Duel. I can't believe we're almost done. Uh, I'm going to read the little author's note because I feel like it's probably relevant for some reason. I don't know why, but we're going to read it. So they put in here terms, the feathers in quotations on the horse means long hair. Horse feathers are long hairs on the horse's legs, not real feathers. Oh, so like a Clydesdale. Yes. Okay. I feel like that's probably going to be relevant at some point later on. Yeah, I think so. And I totally would have been like, what What the fuck is with this bird horse? Is this a pegasus? <laughs> is this a pegasus? Because I know nothing about horses. What's this? Ron asked, picking up something shiny off the floor after Malfoy had slithered off. As he held it up to show Harry, it began to glow. It's a true stone, Harry replied and took it from Ron. It continued to glow as he walked down the hall, explaining to Ron what it did. Wicked, I want one. Ron licked his lips, which had blood on them from where Malfoy had split his lower lip. I don't know. Oh, I forgot they wrestled. Oh, that's right. They wrestled. I was like, what? Yes, because Ron negotiated the terms of the duel for Harry. At just like book one. Like always. Like always. Harry wanted to put the invisibility cloak over him. Do you think Malfoy will miss it? It's not like his father can't buy him a new one. No, Harry placed the chain and the stone into a pocket. They're rare, and Malfoy might accuse you of stealing it if he saw you with it. I'll give it to Professor LaSalle, which reminds me, you should probably put on the invisibility cloak. Oh, that's right, because Ron's coming to his lesson. Oh, I forgot they were going to go do that. Ron stopped and pulled out the cloak. Do you think he's going to snitch? Not if he doesn't want the whole school to find out you beat him up. How do I look? Can't see a thing. Good. Now be quiet. We're almost there, Harry cautioned. You know what, though? Shh. That felt good. 
What did? Breaking Malfoy's nose. It felt like moving through the flu network, only without all the smoke and ash. As soon as he felt his feet planted firmly on the lawn, he had to check himself to make sure that all of him had made it successfully over to where Snape stood. It's about time, Snape commented harshly. He was in a sour mood, an exceptionally bad one. That was wonderful, Harry, LaSalle said gleefully. You caught on quick. No splinchings, no winding up in the middle of the Forbidden Forest. They stood outside on the lawn. Harry had successfully apparated from one point at the edge of the Forbidden Forest to a place a few yards away at Snape's side. Now try again. Professor Snape wasn't half as pleased looking as LaSalle. So Harry held tight to his wand and uttered the spell while concentrating on the point where he wished to apparate. The whole incident with Draco Malfoy was pushed to the back of his mind with the excitement of learning this new spell. He wished he could see Ron's face as he glanced over at Hagrid's vegetable patch to where he knew Ron had taken a seat on a nearby tree stump. Now remember, Snape explained as he walked across the lawn toward Harry who had just apparated next to Professor LaSalle. Remember to keep a clear idea in your mind of your destination and never, never try to disapparate without your wand. It is important that you only use your wand. This is a spell that cannot be done safely with a borrowed wand. Are you listening to me, Potter? Yes, Professor. Only attempt to apparate without my wand. Snape got furious at this while LaSalle laughed with Harry. I think he heard you the first time, Sev, LaSalle broke in. You've got the hang of it, don't you, Harry? Professor LaSalle had lightened up somewhat, and Harry was thankful that he had. He didn't know if he would have survived apparition lessons otherwise. Well now, is that it for today? I believe it is. No. Snape had an odd look on his face, one that Harry couldn't discern. Similar to the one at the end of last year's feast. Dumbledore is supposed to be here. He is? LaSalle looked puzzled, then his face darkened. Oh. Suddenly, Harry remembered the true stone. If Dumbledore was supposed to be joining them, he thought it best to return it now. Professor LaSalle, he pulled the true stone from his pocket. I found this in the hall. I think it belongs to Malfoy. He drew out the dull, white-colored crystal fastened to the silver chain. LaSalle drew it away from Harry, who was reminded that he couldn't come in contact with the professor. So he turned to Snape, who held out his hand for it. It started to glow as Harry handed it to him, and it continued to do so as Snape tucked it safely away. Headmaster? LaSalle was looking over the lawn at an approaching figure. Both Harry and Snape turned to see. And how are the lessons coming along? Dumbledore's voice was soft and friendly, yet Harry picked up an uncharacteristic hint of sadness. I aberrated, Professor, Harry informed, smiling. Ah, yes, very good, Harry. Remember, though, you can't aberrate into Hogwarts, and you must always use your wand. Not Mr. Weasley's, not Miss Granger's, but only yours. Harry swore that he caught a sly look pass from Snape to LaSalle. So, Dumbledore sounded so old. Everything ready for tonight? Everyone's been contacted and the potion is ready? Snape gave a curt nod. And is everything set as far as you're concerned? He asked gravely of LaSalle. Yes, headmaster, LaSalle replied quietly. Dumbledore placed his hands behind his back and let out a long sigh. He studied the grass before turning to Harry. Did you bring an extra change of clothes with you, Harry? Harry nodded sickly as he now realized what the change of clothes was for. I brought an old pair of robes, he explained. I thought that they were going to be used for, for a lesson involving cauldron cakes or something. He felt so stupid after saying this. Cauldron cakes? Dumbledore chuckled as he glanced at Snape. You're using cauldron cakes in your lesson, Severus? I would have never given it a thought. Normally, Harry would have expected Snape to scowl, but his mouth curled up into a sort of smile. 
Oh, and if I could see your glasses too, Harry, Dumbledore withdrew his wand as Harry handed him the change of clothes. Harry removed his glasses and handed those over as well. Dumbledore softly mumbled some words and tapped them, and there appeared an identical pair. I feel bad, Harry said as Dumbledore returned his glasses to him. You having to turn into me for this? And why should that make you feel bad? Dumbledore was digging through his pockets. He stopped when he found what he was looking for and brandished a small pair of golden scissors in the shape of a crane. Well, you're a great wizard, Harry explained. Are you going to fight Voldemort looking like me? Because you should look like you. It wouldn't be right. No. There was a brilliant flash of color, then the fluttering of wings. Harry felt something settle down on his shoulder. Dumbledore leaned back and smiled. It will be an honor. I'll be transforming to look like another great wizard. And if you don't agree, I believe Fox would vouch for me. Harry turned his head to see the scarlet and gold phoenix perched on his shoulder. Now see here, Dumble said jokingly as Fox put his head next to Harry's ear. What's the meaning of this? Don't like this old man anymore? As if in response, Fox flapped his enormous wings and glided over to sit on Dumbledore's shoulder. Dumbledore reached up and stroked lovingly the bright plumage. I thought I'd take him outside for a bit, let him stretch his wings. He smiled and turned back to Snape. How's Bertram doing? Snape looked somewhat startled by the question. He turned away before replying in a barely audible tone. I let him go. Evidently, Dumbledore hadn't been expecting this response, and it troubled him. Harry could read it in the way he was looking at Snape, who was trying to avoid him. When it seemed that Snape was not going to turn around, Dumbledore approached Harry. Harry, I'm going to need some of your hair for the potion. He placed the clothes on the ground with the small golden scissors and trimmed a small lock of Harry's messy black hair and placed it into a small pouch. Harry couldn't stand it any longer. I need to go with you, he stated firmly. This is partly my fault, Voldemort being back. Dumbledore's face crinkled up and Harry swore that he saw tears forming in the wizard's eyes. No, Harry, he said ever so softly. You have done so much. He threw a comforting arm over Harry's shoulders. Never think that Voldemort's existence is your fault. But if I hadn't been there last year, there's nothing you could have done. It was my fault for not catching Crouch. Years ago, I would have never let such a thing slip by. He trailed off. No, I failed you. You should have never had to have had gone through such an ordeal. I should have been there that night with you. Fox stretched his wings, embracing both headmaster and student in glistening feathers. Harry looked over and spotted a tear that had trickled down Dumbledore's cheek, lodged itself by his crooked nose. Now, now, he said, drawing away. What's past is past. We must now look to the future. Do things best we can. So tonight, I don't want you to worry. I have faith that all will be put right tonight. And... The one thing I ask of you is to stay in the castle. Don't leave, even to visit Hagrid. Then he said in a louder tone, I'm sure that you and Mr. Ronald Weasley can find something to do inside the school. In fact, I'd like to ask Mr. Weasley to be sure that you do. Harry had to smile. How'd you know? He whispered. Dumbledore chuckled. When you're as old as me, you'll know too. I'm an old man, Harry. An old, old man. And Dumbledore turned away, heading towards Snape with Fox still standing guard on his shoulder. Now run along, Harry, and try not to worry yourself too much about this. Harry felt absolutely horrible about the planned duel for that night. Then again, Malfoy had made him so angry. He was Death Eater material, no question. And his father was probably out, well, hopefully the Sal would be successful in distracting him. He walked alone down the long corridors, thinking about Dumbledore and Snape and Sirius and Lupin. The sunset had been violently pink and it lit up the hallways, but was now slowly fading as darkness fell. He'd make this quick. 
he'd put his full energy behind some simple disarming spell and have Malfoy knocked out against the wall before the duel had barely begun. Then he could return to his room and just wait for morning. He came to the spot where Malfoy had said that they should meet, and he waited. It wasn't quite nine yet, so he slid down to the floor and sat studying his wand. It was rather beautiful. A simple work of art. The wood was polished to where it nearly shone, and the handle was carved so it fit in his hand. Though now his hand was much larger, and if he grew any more, it might not fit so perfectly. So you ready? Malfoy loomed over him his black robes making his complexion even paler. His hands were set firmly on his hips. I've been waiting here. And Harry heaved himself up off the floor. Shall we then? The way Malfoy was looking at him gave Harry the urge to just throw their wands aside and decide this with fists. (laughs) They were about the same height, but Malfoy had a rather frail build. Harry followed him deeper into the dungeons. At least he wouldn't have to worry about Snape for once. He felt truly sick with worry for the greasy potions master. Malfoy stopped at a heavy wooden door and tried the knob. Alohomora, he commanded when that didn't work and the door clicked open. After you. I don't think so. Harry was still waiting for some sort of deception. You go first. You still don't trust me, Potter? Malfoy tried to sound hurt. Really? I'm looking forward to this duel. I found it. There it is. <laughs> no, I wouldn't trust you behind a canut, Harry muttered as Malfoy entered the room. It was evidently used for potions in progress as there were numerous cauldrons bubbling over fires in the back. There seemed to be enough room for a duel, though, and it appeared vacant. He scanned the room carefully before entering just to be sure. It's only me. See, no tricks, as I promised. For once, it seemed as if Draco was speaking the truth. He stepped into the center and withdrew his wand, but as he did, the door slammed shut and the lock slid across, apparently on its own. A horrible feeling crept into him. There was someone else in the room. His heart raced as he looked around. Then it occurred to him that the person could be invisible. You deceived me! Harry tried to sound more angry than scared. But it didn't come out that way. There's someone else here. I don't see anyone, Malfoy said shyly. And I kept my word. No crab, no goyle, no other friends of mine, no professors. Wildly, Harry tried to sort out who could be left. The bloody baron? No, a school ghost would never harm a student or take part in any silly duel. Why did he have to be so stupid? Oh, I will admit that I did invite one person, Malfoy said offhandedly. Since you seem to have had so much to say about my father, I thought it would be nice if I gave you the chance to say it to his face. A sick feeling hit him. He needed to get out now. There were no windows, only the door. Harry gripped his wand tightly and made a run for it. But as he had feared, he didn't make it to the door. Lucius Malfoy tore off an invisibility cloak and stood squarely in front of him. Harry stopped just before hitting him and thought quickly. Putting his newfound strength behind his wand, he yelled out, Expelliarmus! Mr. Malfoy was thrown off his feet. His back slammed against the door. The wind knocked out of him. As he slid to the floor, he stared wide-eyed at Harry. Crucio! Harry whirled around in time to see Draco with his wand raised and his face an expression of sheer and utter glee, as this was the first time he could use this curse on a person. A flash of light burst from his wand. It was too late to block it entirely, but Harry managed to lessen the effect. A pain ripped through him, causing him to stumble. He staggered for a moment. Draco's spell had been surprisingly strong, and for once Harry wondered what would happen if he himself had cast that spell. He wanted to, but instead he raised his wand. Serpent Sortina? A snake burst from the tip of his wand, just as it had with Snape whispering in Draco's ear several years ago. Get him, Harry commanded and pointed to Draco. He's trying to hurt me. He's a parcel mouth? He heard Lucius croak. Lucius Malfoy was getting up, rubbing his head and licking 
at the blood on the corner of his mouth. Harry turned to face him while Draco was kept busy with the snake. You're a tenacious brat, Lucius smat. Draco, stop playing around with that snake. I may need your help. <laughs> oh, Lush. <laughs> From behind him, there was a bang, and Harry thought he heard the snake scream out, but didn't turn around. Lucius was far more dangerous than his son, and Harry didn't dare take his eyes off of him. Lucius's wand suddenly burst with a bright light, and cords shot towards Harry to bind him. But he was successful in repelling them until his legs were pulled out from under him. Draco had him by his knees, and he was struggling to keep Harry pinned to the floor. Harry struggled to raise his wand to cast some spell on Draco. However, something crunched down on his arm hard. He gasped in pain as he looked over to see Lucius Malfoy's boot on his wand arm. His wand was torn from his fingers. Then Harry watched in horror as Lucius, in a fit of rage, snapped Harry's wand over his knee and threw the pieces into the fire under one of the simmering cauldrons. The fire hissed hungrily and briefly grew in brilliance as it consumed the broken wand. Harry saw the wood split and a red feather curl against the heat. There, enough of that nonsense, Malfoy muttered as he removed his foot off Harry's arm and repeated the spell with the shining cords, and this time Harry couldn't block it. Once Harry was bound, Draco stood up and stared down at him. I'm so sorry, Potter, but you chose your own fate. I will say I'm sorry that you didn't choose your side better, for I must admit you're very good. You and I would have made a wonderful team. Stop crowing, Draco, and tell me what time curfew starts. Mr. Malfoy was picking up his invisibility cloak off the floor. Harry noticed that it definitely wasn't his as it appeared larger and older. No doubt, Mr. Malfoy had easily been able to afford one of his own. Ten, Draco replied. He was holding out his wand menacingly over Harry. Ten, I thought I told you I wanted him down here during curfew so that I could get him out of here more safely. But I couldn't get him down here any later. I tried. I was lucky to get him to come here alone. Lucius paced and stared at the floor. Get him out. Fear began to freeze Harry as he lay on the cold stone floor. Was Lucius going to take him to Voldemort? Oh, God. He had to get out of this. If he showed up with Dumbledore there, he tested the cords that bound him but they only seemed to get tighter the more pressure he placed on them. I've got an idea, Draco said timidly. He seemed jumpy around his father. Lucius stared skeptically at his son, an eyebrow raised. It will be easy, Draco assured. Out with it then. Lucius was jumpy too. Um, Draco's voice was shaky. We put the invisibility cloak on him, then I walk out with you. I'm not supposed to be here, his father pointed out gruffly. If any of the professors stop us, you just tell them that there's been a death in the family and you've come to tell me. I haven't seen Professor Snape all day, and he's probably with everyone right now anyway. So you can say he allowed you to come, and I'll even look all upset and everything. Lucius seemed to be mulling this over. His son actually had come up with a feasible plan. All right, he said at last, and he pointed his wand at Harry's throat. Nunquium sonoris. There was immediately a choking sensation that threatened to constrict Harry's breathing. He found he couldn't make a sound. Things were looking grim. Personally, I would have had Ron standing outside the door. Under the invisibility cloak, following me in. Yeah, like... Yep. Harry was levitated off the floor and turned upright before the invisibility cloak was placed over him. He wanted to scream, but his voice was muted. He wanted to move, but he was held bound. He didn't know this curse that held him, so the counter curse was beyond him. Desperately, hoping to find something that worked, he attempted to call upon the magic power inside him, trying to direct it at the magical cords that bound him. But all he seemed to accomplish in doing this was making the cords stronger. They had made their way up to the main floor and they were walking across the great red carpet that led to the main entrance. Frantically, Harry tried to come up with something, anything. He squirmed, attempted to jar the invisibility cloak to make it slip, 
but the cords got even tighter. Fighting against the pain from the pressure, he jerked his head madly before spotting Professor McGonagall coming their way. Lucius Malfoy, she said darkly. I did not know you had stopped to pay a visit. She looked up and down at his full black robes and cape. Good evening, Professor, Lucius greeted, putting on a false, polite tone. I just stopped by to see my son about some family business. A very unfortunate business, really. She eyed him carefully. Harry began to squirm again. If only he could get one little bit of the cloak to slip down. Did you inform anyone that you were coming? Of course I did. I contacted Severus Snape this morning. Did he not tell you that I was coming? I'm sorry. No, he didn't. McGonagall still didn't look like she trusted what he was saying. Lucius bent down to speak something softly into McGonagall's ear. A death in the family. His great-grandmother. On cue, Draco began to look terribly grieved. Oh, Harry couldn't tell if McGonagall had swallowed the lie or not. I'm most sorry. Are you taking Draco with you? No, he's just seeing me to the door. And again, the Malfoys began to move forward, guiding Harry, whom they had levitated. Goodbye, Potter, Draco said as soon as they were out of earshot of McGonagall. I hope you have a good time. I have never had the chance to meet the Dark Lord before. I'd ask you to tell me all about him, but unfortunately, I don't think you'll be able to. And with that, he marched off back towards the dungeons. Harry gave one last attempt to dislodge the cloak. The cords tightened. It felt like his hands and feet were about to be severed. Still, he struggled until a pain fogged his mind and vision. His body finally forced him to stop, and he could only watch helplessly as he was led out the door and toward the front gate. Once well beyond, on the road to Hogsmeade, Mr. Malfoy grabbed Harry by the arm and touched a loose stone in the wall. There was a familiar feeling of being dragged along by a porky, and Harry's head spun until they landed on firm ground. Immediately fell over with Lucius still holding on to him. The invisibility was pulled off, and to his relief, the cords removed. Slowly, he sat up and massaged his wrist, which had a thick red welt where the cords had bit into his skin. As he looked around him, there appeared to be no one about. He was sitting by a stone wall on a small rise overlooking a field bathed in moonlight. On a distant hill, there stood ruins of an old Scottish abbey. A sharp whining pierced the night air, and Harry turned to see a large gray horse tethered to a scrawny wind-beaten tree. Its dapple coat reflected the light of the three-quarter moon, and he noticed that it had feathers on its legs and enormous plate-sized hooves. Lucius roughly hoisted Harry to his feet, then dragged him over to the horse. It skittered to the side as Harry was forced to climb up behind the saddle. Don't you dare try anything, Lucius warned as he swung himself into the saddle. This Magnus mare happens to be extremely loyal to me. If anything happens, she's been known to bludgeon men to death with her hooves. Malfoy pulled the hood to his black cloak up over his head and pulled out a mask, a Death Eater mask, and positioned it on his face before gathering up the reins. Harry didn't know what else to do but hang on to the back of the saddle as Lucius kicked the horse in the flanks. They started out at a canter across the field the mare's hose throwing clumps of sod as it went. He bounced along on top of the animal's powerful hindquarters as they galloped up a crest towards the abbey ruins. Lucius pulled the mare to a trot as they neared the entrance and Harry feared he'd be shaken off. They clip-clopped across the stone to an intercourtyard where other Magnus mares stood tethered. The animals stopped near the herd, all tacked and ready to be ridden. There were a little more than a dozen. Once the horse had stopped prancing and snorting, Lucius dismounted and pulled Harry roughly down to the ground. Harry felt as if his arm was about to be ripped out of the socket. Malfoy was pulling on him so hard. Something then struck Harry as odd and eased some of his anxiety. His scar didn't hurt. Perhaps Voldemort would come later, but for now, it seemed he wasn't around. 
Harry didn't want to look as he was led into what once had been the main chapel. The roof was gone, the windows gone, weeds now sprouted between the stones on the floor. He was afraid of seeing Snape and Dumbledore. I've brought a gift, Lucius proclaimed loudly upon entering. About fifteen Death Eaters turned to face him, their white masks blank. Lucius' boots clicked across the stones as the emotionless masks watched. It was then that Harry noticed that one of the Death Eaters seemed to stand out from all the rest. His hair was not hidden by a hood. It hung down to his waist in a ponytail, and he held in his long, thin fingers a mage's staff, the stone of which was putting off a soft green glow. End of chapter 17. Jesus Christ. Fun author's note at the end. Did any of the shrewder readers out there notice what happened when Harry tried handing the truth stone to LaSalle as opposed to Severus? I did notice that it didn't glow for LaSalle, but it did for Severus. I noticed that too. I'm so excited. We only have a couple chapters left. I know. I can't believe the story's almost over. I think that's it for now. All right. I was going to ask if you had any final announcements, but apparently not. No, I don't think so. All right. We'll see you guys next week. See you next week. Thank you so much for joining us on our journey through the trap door. Please leave us a review on Facebook or iTunes. It would literally mean the world to us. It really would. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Through the Trap Door 16 or on Twitter at The Trap Door. And please send us an email at Through the Trap Door 16 at gmail.com with any story suggestions. And as always, join us again next Saturday as we travel Through the Trap Door. <laughs> <laughs>